فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today is going to be the first lesson on the kitab جلباب المرأة المسلمة uh, what does جلباب mean and what is, its, what is its definition we will speak about that بإذن الله الكريم this book is written by العلامة المحدث محمد ناصر الدين الألباني رحمه الله and inshallah ta'ala we'll also speak about the biography of the author inshallah ta'ala but before all of that I want to go through why do we want to speak about jilbab of a woman what's the reason why would one want to talk about hijab or jilbab or is there a need to speak about it um, is it something that uh, we should give importance to as you know my beloved brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Qur'an that reminder benefits the believer. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says remind, for verily the reminder benefits the believers. So a believer is the one that whenever he's reminded of Allah, and he is told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sanctioned this, or Allah has obligated this, or Allah has prohibited this, even that they may know of it, it benefits them again. It's a reminder. Allah specifically mentions the people who will benefit from that reminder are specifically who? وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ It benefits their believers. A person who Iman has really settled into their heart. Who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believes that there's going to come a day where they're going to be resurrected. A day where they're going to be accounted for everything that they've said and done. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in another ayah, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافْ وعيد. Remind them with the Qur'an. So the first verse is in Surah Al-Dhariyat, ayah 55. And the second verse that I read is in Surah Al-Qaf, 45. Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ Remind them with the Qur'an. For verily, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ Remind them with the Qur'an for the one who fears the promise that Allah has made. The promises here involve, it involves the fact that Allah promised in Surah Tuqaf that He's going to destroy those who go against Him. The fact that Allah is going to hold account for every single person, what they say and what they do. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to those who are righteous and upright. So the whole verse, surah, surah Tukaf is sort of full of mawa'id and reminders. So here sisters and brothers, when you're told about something that's from the religion, if a brother is told, ya akhi, letting your beards grow is obligatory, he doesn't say, how dare, who gives you the right to talk to me about it? He doesn't say that. That's not a characteristic of a mu'min. A mu'min's characteristics are not like that. Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, there are some people whose statement fascinate you. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا When they speak, they fascinate you the way they put their words and they articulate and how they put their blogs out and how they write their articles or even how they tweet something. It might fascinate you. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ Allah testifies that this person is a very argumentative individual. وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ This individual is very argumentative. That when they are told something basic about the religion, 
and they are told, Akhi, Barakallahu Feek, Shar'an. As a man, Allah made it obligatory on you to do this, 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 this. That if you hear the caller of Adhan and the Masjid is your neighbors with the Masjid, that you have to pray in that Masjid, or you have to pray in the Masjid, and etc. That man will say to you, Barakallahu Feek, Akhi. He reminded me of something. This is the righteous one. The other one, he's Aladdul Khisab. How do you know I don't go? Who, who gave you the rights? What about if I go to another one? Do I have to go to this one specifically? Who said, who gave you the rights to tell what can be done and what can't be done? Who is Aladdul Khisab? And if he turns around and he sees the sea and he sees the sea and he sees the sea and he sees the sea. When he turns around, all he brings about is corruption or she brings about corruption on this earth. Wallahu la yuhibbu al-fasad. Allah doesn't like those who bring about corruption on this earth. Wallahu la yuhibbu al-fasad. Wa idha qila lahu attaqillah. If it's said to that individual, fear Allah. Somebody says to them, wa idha qila. If it's said to that person, attaqillah, fear Allah. Akhi al-kareem, ukhti al-kareemah, fear Allah. This is a statement that makes a person's heart miss a beat. Some, not something light. Ittaqillah. What happens to this person? This person's chest, it swells, it gets angry, it gets ooh, swollen, his face color changes, it gets angry. How dare, who gives you the right to say that to me? Or some people would say, you fear Allah. A believer, when he said that to, the first thing he says is, is there something I did wrong? Is there specifically something that comes to mind that you know that I need to specifically sharpen on? This is what he does. Because of the wise statement, scholars differ on the authenticity of this hadith, like in that the believer is a mirror of his brother, or is a mirror of his sister. The mirror tells you exactly what he sees of you. The mirror doesn't deceive you. When you go and you wake up in the morning, and you stand in front of the window mirror, and you look into it, the mirror will only reflect as you look. It won't tell you different. A believer is like that. He will tell you exactly your shortcomings. He'll tell you exactly the harms and the problems that you have. He won't lie to you, just like the mirror won't lie to you. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اتَّقِ اللَّهَ أَخَذَتُ الْعِزْبَ أَخَذَتُ الْعِزْبَ أَخَذَتُ الْعِزْبَ أَخَذَتُ الْعِزْبَ فَحَسْبُهُ جَهَنَّمُ وَلَبِئْسَ الْمِهَادِ The hellfire becomes that person's what? Final abode. So brothers and sisters, this topic, Jilbab, is from the obligatory things that are upon women, that Allah has obliged upon women. As much as that is spoken about, other matters of the religion are spoken about. Other things are spoken about. It's not specifically directed at that. And also that won't be dismissed. The jilbab won't be dismissed. The hijab will not be dismissed. It will not be dismissed. But one thing I do accept, which is, if you look at the ulama al mutaqaddimin the early scholars, you will find that they never used to author a book specifically on hijab. And the reason why they didn't do that is because they were, at, they were with a society and a people. It wasn't very common that a book would be authored on the issue of hijab. It's because this matter was accepted and it was agreed upon. There was no discussion about it. The one who knew he was doing, or the woman who knew that she wasn't wearing hijab and she wasn't adhering to what she was upon her, they knew what? She knew what she was doing was a crime. She knew she was a wrongdoer. She knew she was going against Allah's command. She wasn't justifying her actions. She knew she's a sinner. And she knew she was upon clear-cut misguidance. Or she was a, she's upon clear-cut wrong. So there was no uh, argument on that side. So what the ulama used to do is the books of fiqh that they would author, they would always add a part of it in it. When they spoke about the issue of libas, clothing, they would always speak about the issue of hijab and the women's dressing in there. But when the colonization came to the Muslim world, the colonies and the, the kuffar came to the Muslim world, the French colonized and the British, and they went to the Muslim world, one of the first things that they worked towards, one of the first things that they worked towards is to bring the women out of their houses. To bring the women out of their houses, to make the women not dress the way Islamically they should dress. Even this has not only affected Muslims. Pay attention to this. They did not only do this to the Muslims. They even did this to the 
the non-Muslims. They did it to the Christians and they did it to the Jews and other faiths. They made them have this problem as well. But we Muslims suffered highly because of the fact that the French colonized many of the Muslim countries. The British, they colonized many of the Muslim countries. And so they directed their efforts in corrupting the women. So now, if you look at the countries like Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, countries like that, if you look at it today, the way that they would dress is exactly the way that the way that you you would see the, the, the women dress in the UK, the women dress in America, Australia, and Western countries. They've even taken to those countries the clothing lines that you would see here, they got taken to those countries. And then they got set role models that they need to follow, women they need to look up to. Those women now are the ones who set the, uh, the reality or, or the way that a woman should dress. So they look up to these women. Now these women are not just disbelievers. They are not just kuffar. They are the worst of them. They are the aradil, the lowest ranked ones. Those who became famous through prostitution and those who became famous through drugs. Those who, like people who are blacklisted from countries in the West. They are not allowed to travel to countries due to the fact that they are criminals. So, I remember one time one of these artists, these singers, he was asked, uh, why have you never done a tour in Canada? And he said, oh, I'm banned from Canada. I am banned from Canada. I'm not allowed to travel there. People like that are those who people look up to and they, 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 they love. What made the matters worse is they didn't just take the women and take them out of the houses and take off their hijab from them, but they actually pushed them to go on social media and to come out on television. This is before YouTube and everything came, there was television. The woman was told to slap makeup on her face, dr uh, dress in a particular way, and they brought her on television. And after internet came, subhanallah, subhanallah, matters went out of hand. The woman, she would come, she would dress the way she wishes to dress. They killed the essence of hayat shyness. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, underline this. The statement of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحْيِ وَإِنَّ مِمَّا أَدْرَكَ النَّاسِ مِنْ كَلَامِ النُّبُوَّةِ الْأُولَى إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحْيِ فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ One of the wisest statements that have been inherited from the previous prophets was that if you are not shy, do what you wish. أخي, shyness is a component, it is the thing. Male or female, if you lose haya, shyness, wallahi, there is no difference between you and the, an -an, the cattle and the animals. There's nothing different between you and the animals. Shyness is what leaves and allows you to hold back some morality. Come. Are you with me, brothers? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Istahyu min Allahi haqq al -haya. The Prophet said to the companions one day when he was sitting with them, he said, be shy the way Allah deserves to be shy of. Be shy as Allah deserves to be shy of. Then the companions, they said, we are shy of Allah and praises to Him. We are. Then the Prophet said, He said, Man min Allah That the person who is shy of Allah, he should protect his eyes. Basically, his head and everything on it, his eyes, his ears, his mouth, your head, everything. Hijab comes in there, covering yourself up. Two, lowering your gaze. Three, what comes out of your mouth and the statements and the speeches that you say, what you listen to and what you, what you let your ears hear. If you're shy, do that. وَالْبَطْنَ And protect the stomach وَمَحَوَى Everything around it. What you eat and what you bring into your, prior, your, your stomach and what you drink and what, what fear Allah and think, be conscious of that. And then the Prophet said, وَلْيَذْكُرِ الْمَوْتُ وَالْبِلَىٰ Let him remember death and that calamity and trials and tribulations which await him. 
Haya min Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. So what you see is these, these the, the, the Western countries right now, who many of our Muslim sisters and brothers are even are really looking up to, the things that they are pushing, it's no haya. Look at let the matter not just be sisters. Look at the brothers as well. Look at a brother whose trousers is so low that you can see his backside. What haya? What world would that work in? Who that you can see his underwear? What? Where's shyness? Where's haya? Where is the shyness? Are you with me? Who wants to see that? But it shows you what has been. Now, if you look at where this came from, and who it came from, and where is it really, where does this go back to? It has root with prison. And people were in prison. And the clothing that they were given that was bigger than them. And how their trousers would sag because of the fact that it was bigger than them. And these things have been taken and they've been adopted by a Muslim Muhammad, Zakaria, Khalid. These are Islamic names. These are people whose names are companions, noble companions. He's now what? He looks like Fulan and Alan. I remember a time where, Billahi alaykum, look at this. Look how much shaitan has fallen. When Michael Jackson was out and you know, people were looking up to him and everything, having your trousers above your ankles was what? Was fashion. Michael Jackson said it. The Muslim man will not do it because Allah and his messenger said it. Wallahi, he won't. Michael Jackson said it, he would. Any, now, bid becomes fashion because of uh, a rapper or an artist. Or, it, it's a fashion. It's a fashion. Now, when you can pay attention here. Whose clothing is above the ankles today? The men. Uh, sorry, the women. Who trousers is long and is dragging on the ground? The men. The axe. Don't you now believe that this is not an issue of uh, coincidence? That it just happened? It looks, Billahi alaykum, look. What looks good is that the woman's clothing is high. Miniskirt. The higher it is, the better. The more meat and the more flesh that she shows, better. And the man. The more his trousers and his clothing is what? Is dragging and is pulling, the better. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man jarra thawbahu, anyone whose garment drags on the ground, khuyala out of arrogance, lam yandurullahu, Allah does not look at him, yawm al qiyamati, the day of judgment. Allah will not look at you the day of judgment. Umm Salama then she said, Ya Rasulullah, fakayfa yasna'ana. What would the women do with their, their the, the tail of their garment? When the her jilbab or hijab she's wearing, the part that's dragging, what should what she do with that? The Prophet said, Yulkhina Shibran. Shibra is this a, a hand span. He said she would let it grow a, like a hand span. So after it, on the ground, hand span. She said, Eden tan kashifu akadamuhunna. Or message of Allah. Or messenger of Allah, then when she lifts her leg, she's walking, then her leg would show. This is to show you, brothers and sisters, how even the women at the time of the Prophet they really wanted to cover themselves. What did they say? Their legs would show, she said. Then the Prophet said, Then, okay, dira, arm, span, she, she should not lengthen it more than that. Tirmidhi narrated and Sheikh Nasir authenticated it. Today, today, if a woman does that, it will never be added into the category of fashion. You won't. They're not going to add that into it. Are you with me? It's not a fashion. Why? Allah said it. Shaitan has come to divert everybody from what Allah has sanctioned. That's it. Fashion today is anything that goes against Allah. Allah said, drink with your right, you drink with your left. That's fashion. Ah. Anything Allah has sanctioned. Allah said, let your beards grow and shorten your moustache. The opposite is, is, is fashion. Ah. The opposite is what? It's fashion. The, because the shaitan, all he is come for is to pay, take the people away from what Allah said. That's it. And he would beautify that and he will make it look good. And it would, he will make it be the fashion and the thing. Today, so we say the situation of the Muslim women has changed greatly. If you look at 
how it was bad for a woman to dress. I remember many years ago when I was young, if you saw a sister who wasn't wearing a hijab, wallahi, my, when I was young, and you came and you talked to her about it, wallahi, billahi, even she's not wearing it, she's willing to listen. She will listen, she'll say, Jazakallah khairan, brother. And she will leave. She will listen. You can see that spark of Iman in her heart. And she will take on board what you said. May, she may not implement it, she may, but the respect that she has, the fact that you are telling her about Allah in the day of judgment. And you're reminding her, she's willing to listen. Huh? Today, I, I remember one time I went to a sister, I advised her, I said, Sister, Shara'an, what you're doing is not right. I don't know your dhuruf, your situation, and what you're going through in your life. But I only just want to say, that if my sister was doing wrong, I would like a brother who's practicing to, to, to tell her to fear Allah and to remember Allah. I'm only doing it out of concern. As much as I like to be advised myself. She said, no, the way she made me, she said, get away. Don't talk to me. Who gave you the right to talk to me? Let me guess. You want my number? Wow. Okay, that's it. So the takabbur and the arrogance and even the, the rage that was in her head. Are you there? Wallahi sisters, I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said that al-amnu min makri Allah can be kufr. Al-amnu min makri Allah can reach kufr. Which is what? If you believe you can receive safety from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's destruction. If a person believes only Allah can judge me. It's between me and Allah. Allah is ghafur rahim Al-Amnu min makri Allahi. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said it reaches kufr, haddul kufr. That if a person is sinning and they are committing a crime and they say that, don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very merciful. He's got other things that he can hold me account for. He won't. Or things like that, this is serious. That is a serious statement. Or only Allah can judge me. Or it's between me and Allah. Or it's only between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our mother, Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, a really chast woman, afifa wallah, and she's a siddiqa, binti siddiq. This is a woman who should be taken as a role model. Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, ummuna, our mother, she said, law anna rasulallah, she's talking about her time, she said, if the messenger of Allah, if the Prophet of Allah saw the women today, the way they are, if the Prophet was to see the women today, how they are and the way that they appear, the Prophet would prohibit them from leaving. And he would have said, it is haram for you guys to leave your houses. Allahu Akbar. That is the time of who? Our mother Aisha. A time of Iman. A time of knowledge. A, a time where Nabiullah Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam hasn't died long ago. Are you there? She's saying that if the Prophet was to see the women today, the way that they dress, the way that they are, the Prophet would have clearly and categorically said to them all, stay home and don't leave. Now, what would the situation be if the women are told to do videos and come out? If what about makeup and this was shown to Aisha and she was to see that? What would she have said? This matter is very serious. The matter is very serious. My beloved brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he honored women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he honored women. He honored, honored her as a mother. As a mother, Allah gave her a state that he hasn't given no father. Allah says in the Quran, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us and informed us to be dutiful towards your parents. 
especially who your mother حملته أمه كرها ووضعته كرها your mother she carried you through hardship and pain and she gave birth to you through hardship and pain وحمله وفصاله ثلاثون شهرا 30 months is the pregnancy and then 30 months is also the uh, pre- uh, breastfeeding so 24 of those is what 24 of those is what it is breastfeeding and at a minimum six months she's going to what she's going to carry you that's minimum if she's carried you for nine months even more she's this is what allah allah look took that into consideration and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that based on that the mother has more rights than the father the mother has more rights than the father so allah wa ta'ala he did wasiya for the mother look at the western world, world today have they have they given this to the mother have they no they've not given no consideration to the efforts and the hard work that she has gone through Anyone who's married, who has a wife, would see the hardship it is to raise a child. Has your wife ever left a child with you for one day? You leave the house with two different sh- shoes, like, whoa. Imagine if that child was grown inside you. Imagine you are the one who's breastfeeding that child again. Like, no other person, it comes back to you. Imagine, imagine, imagine. this is something else. This is, it is taken into in consideration. There's no consideration for the mother in this affairs in the Western world. Wallahi, the child, the minute his mother reaches, are you with me? He reaches a, she reaches a particular age, he's getting her ready for what? For the foster home. Or, huh? Not foster home, what's it called? Care, care, care center. His own mum. The care center is where he's taking her. She's with old people. No, like he pays, he gives them money, they look after her. That's the haqaiq and the reality that they're pushing. Korea, work. And where's your daughter? My daughter, she's, she's working. And what about your son? He's work. I remember one time reading an article that a woman said, um, she became very old. She's like, she had a son and a daughter. And she said, oh, I gave all my money to my dog. All the money that she's had, she's very rich. She gave all of it to her dog. She said, my dog. Because she said, my dog really took care of me. It's a reality, it's true, the dog did everything for her Then her own children Islam has honoured you as a mother Honoured you, placed you in a high status If you look at the Quran, Allah always mentions Tawheed and the mother And the parents, Tawheed and the parents Tawheed parents, Tawheed parents Are you with me brothers? Allah mentions La ilaha illallah and then your parents it's not a light matter. So don't say to yourself, or don't be convinced, don't let them tell you that Islam subjugates women and Islam doesn't give women rights. Wallahi, he gave it. Starting from the mother. She has to be. You can't look in your mother's eyes and shout at her. You can't say oof to your mother. All of that. And you all know the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man came to the Prophet of Allah, he said, Ya Rasulallah, man ahaqqu nasi bi husni sahabati. Who from the people is most deserving of my companionship? The Prophet said, Ummuka, your mother. Allahu Akbar. Qala thumma man. And then he said, after that, who? Qala ummuka, your mother. Qala thumma man. Qala ummuka, your mother. Qala thumma man. Qala thumma abuka. Then your father. Why don't, they, why don't women look at this? You don't find a Muslim, huh? There's a feminine movement, right? So let's say a masculine movement. Who come out and say, ah, oh, look at us being oppressed here. Women are being pushed three times before us. They're being given more rights. Are you with me? What about if the mother, when she gave birth, she just threw the child and the father raised the child and the child is 15? Huh? The, fa- the child is what? The child is what? It's 15. Uh, the father raised this child with his own bare hands. He changed his nappy, looked after the kids. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Does that make the mother and the father? Wallahi, the father is not even equal to a push from the pushes of the night she gave birth. Are you there? Shara, this is hukum. Allah made it. Man can't argue about this. 
A man cannot argue about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he honored her as a daughter. Allah honored the woman as a daughter. How has he honored her as a daughter? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَىٰ ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوِدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ That when Banu uh, Quraysh, a girl will be born, they will be buried alive. This girl, وَأْدُ الْبَنَاتِ A girl had no qima. She's born. How am I going to face the community? What am I going to tell the community? Stress. So what did they do? They buried the girl alive. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَىٰ ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوِدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ يتوارى من القوم من سوء ما بشر به أن يمسكوا على هون أم يدسه في التراب على سامع حكمون. All he thinks of is how am I going to face the community? My wife was pregnant for nine months. All she gave birth to is a girl. What am I going to tell the people now? He's now thinking of what place in the earth is he going to bury her alive? He is thinking of burying the girl who he, his wife gave birth to alive. They don't kill her and then bury her. They take her while she's still walking on this earth. They grab her, they put her into the earth, and they place sand over her. Why? Because she's a girl. Because she's a? She's a girl. That's it. No other crime she's done, nothing wrong. Oh. And some stories have been transmitted that some of them, whilst they were digging the graves, their daughters were cleaning their beards, you know, taking the dust off their shoulders, whilst they were burying, kissing their fathers, and they were preparing the place that they're going to bury her in. That's where it reached. Islam came and liberated women, freed them from this, gave them rights, hukuk. A woman was not allowed to be seen in, community, in the community. She was nothing. She was like the animals. That's how they saw her. She was a, uh, she would only give birth to children. That's her job. Nothing else. You have to imagine the mindset that the Prophet has to come with and the effort and the hard work that he has to come to a community who are thinking like this. Not being just thinking like this for one or two years. This has been generations and generations and centuries. This is how they've been thinking. He وسلم, changed that. Did he just leave? He said, وسلم, any woman or any independent who loses their daughter, this is not for a brother, this is not for a son, a daughter specifically. He raises her, he grows and she dies. The Prophet said, Ala wa huwa fil jannati kahatini. Me and him are like this in paradise. This is not for us, boy. Only a daughter. Now, if you have a daughter, and you care of her, you look after her, you perfect her uh, nurturing, you and I are like this in Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Who? Who is this? The Prophet himself. Islam gave that to women. Honored them like that. That their father is the man who needs to look after her. Her clothing, her dressing, her emotions, her feelings, the way she thinks, everything is upon him. That when he talks to her, he dresses her in a very, very pleasant way. Hi, come here, princess. What do you want? Her clothing, what she wants to wear. She doesn't have to go out there and look for it. Everything is on him. He does that for her. Protects her from outside. Then comes the wife. Islam honored the woman. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Live with them in good. Live with them in good. Whenever you get angry, you can't just punch her in the face. Are you with me? You can't. وَلِذَلِكَ وَنْ فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ قَيْسِ فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ قَيْسِ Two men came for her hand in marriage. فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ قَيْسِ Two men wanted to get married to her. The first man was who? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And the second one was what? Abu Jahm. The Prophet said to Fatima, are these the two men who've come for your hand in marriage? She said, yes. Because the man has to have a characteristics and a, uh, a way, the Prophet said to her, as for the first man, Muawiyah, he has no money. And marriage involves money. Second, Abu Jahmin is the second candidate who was asked for your hand in marriage. Ha, he beats women. Whenever he gets angry, he beats women. Another narration mentions, he has la yulqil asa al atiqi. The stick is on his shoulder. He's got a stick ready. If anybody does anything wrong, he whips them. Both of them, the Prophet said, don't go for them. Who should I go for? Go for Usama ibn Zayd. 
and she married Usama and the marriage between her and Usama lasted. It lasted, right? Are you with me? Does that make sense? Another woman came to the Prophet والسلام, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I was previously married to Rufa'a. He was my previous husband. I left him. Divorce finished. She said, I got married to another man. She said this to the Prophet. She said, Ya the oh, Messenger of Allah, he sexually is not pleasing to me. He hasn't sexually pleased me. He doesn't. My old husband is better. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said to her, have you had intimacy with this one, the second one? She said, no, Messenger of Allah. He said, you have to. The reason is because, hatta tanki ghayra, that you marry a man other than, because he finished his, all of his divorces, the next man that she has to marry is not just a contract. Ah, uh, they have to have a relationship. Then he said, if you want to leave him, then you're a lady, right? You have the right to leave him. You can leave him if you want. Islam didn't say, oh, sorry, you can't. You can't just jump from one guy to another. No, you can't. It didn't say that. It gave her the right that if she doesn't want to be in this marriage with this man, she doesn't want him, that she what? That she can leave and go back to her, her previous husband. Are you with me? Shara'an, it permitted it for her. This is all the things that the Sharia has taken into consideration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave her mirath inheritance. She can inherit. Before, the wife was part of the inheritance. She was from the things that he was inherited. When your father dies, the things that are inherited from your father is his wife's. They would inherit the father's wife. The, like the cars and the money and everything, she's just part of that. She would be inherited as well. She would have to go with a man that she didn't want. She's inherited. That's how it goes. She has no say in anything. Islam honored women. It honored her from what the Arabs used to do. They used to pimp the women. They would take her and they would pimp her. Nah? Allah said in the ayah, تُكْلِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ Do not oppress your women into what? Fornication and adultery. In aradna تَحَصُّونَ And if they are willing to be chaste, this is what they want to be. Don't go and force them. Because the person, what he would do is, because the woman has no rights and she can't say anything, he wants to make money from her. He wants to make money. That's what he wants to do. Are you with me? So what does he do? He takes her and he sells her. She makes money, he takes all the money. She's taking nothing. She's taking nothing. Nothing is hers. He takes all of her money and what he says to her is carry on prostitution. And she keeps doing the prostitution. Naam. Islam came and he lifted her from that. Honored her and protected her from any of uh, all of that. All of that. So Islam, it took into consideration every part of the woman's. She's a mother, she's looked after. She's a wife, she's looked after. A daughter, she's looked after. That's the situation a woman is either in. She's either a daughter, she's got her father to look after her. And it's upon him to look after her. Second is that she's a wife and she's got a husband to look after her. Now this husband that marries her, he's, uh, things that he does for her is that he doesn't physically harm her. He doesn't beat her. He took her from her father and her parents. He brought her into the house. He doesn't harm her. The strength that he has today, he uses it to defend her, not to humiliate or belittle her or beat her. She's, he's protecting her. That's his job. His job is to protect her, not to weaken her and destroy her. She's a mother that when, she, when her children grow, her son, her daughter, when they grow, they look out, out, out for their mother. She doesn't have to run around and still be working. She's well off. She's being given. She's told to relax. She's told to take the back seat. Relax. Where do you want to go? Mom, your Umrah and your Hajj is... Oh, every year you've got it. Don't worry. What else do you want? Are you with me? This is what Takrimul Mar'a is. This is what honoring a woman is. But honoring a woman, my beloved brothers and sisters, is not what the West have set. The, 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 uh, the liberation or the, uh, 
the what's it called the um, women liberation movement or feminist and what they push is not in any way form or shape is not in any form or shape what takrim al they are not honoring women 